um, this is our first recorded class um, for 11.58. Today I want to try to, I know we're running behind, things are nuts, um, but I would like to try and get us back on track um, by talking about both Being White, Children of Color, and the Disney Fairy Tale Princess, um, as well as the video um, Mommy Wata, uh, which is the fairy tale. Um, okay, so Seeing White, Children of Color, and the Fairy Tale Princess. So obviously this is a somewhat difficult text to read, um, and that's kind of what I was getting at when I was telling you guys, like, academic sources are harder to read. So as you go through an academic source, I really would recommend that you read the abstract first so that you already know what the author is going to argue. So for example, in the abstract of this, um, it, I mean, they don't make you look for it, right? Like, this article argues that children's self-image is affected by the ways in which they see themselves in text, both the verbal and visual, and that fairy tales play an important role in shaping self-image and the belief system of children. Um, the images found in fairy tales, therefore, have particular importance for children of color in relation to the internalization of white privileging. This article presents a comparative analysis of the Disney... Disney version of six classic fairy tales spotlighted in Disney's Princess, The Essential Guide, against the classic source text version, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Snow White, and Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, from the perspective of ideological and racial basis in the context of the goals of multicultural education. Findings from this analysis support the need for the development of critical literacy skills in children as well as in their teachers and highlight the importance of exposing children to transcultural literature. Um, so obviously like a lot of somewhat difficult vocabulary in there, but if you just break it down sentence by sentence, you can see that this is really just trying to say that um, Disney movies and fairy tales matter because they teach children um, like what they should strive for. So the way they see themselves represented or don't see themselves represented has importance for children. Um, so um, this article has also told us in its abstract that its real focus will be on the way that Disney movies, Disney versions of fairy tales privilege whiteness. So um, keeping in mind it was written in 2005, so like we didn't have um, we didn't have Moana yet, we didn't, we didn't, I don't think we had, yeah, we didn't have the Princess and the Frog yet, um, although that is also somewhat controversial. So our Disney princesses that we can really think of are like, um, Beauty and the Beast, so Belle, um, Cinderella, Ariel from The Little Mermaid, um, oh, Aurora from Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, um, and Jasmine from Aladdin. Um, and I would also, so when you're thinking about these texts, keep in mind that um, Pocahontas, remember we watched Pocahontas, it was a mistake, um, and it was discussed in that video how Pocahontas and Jasmine are the two um, like over-sexualized princesses, and they're also the only two that weren't white. Um, so this article is going to tell us about that. So when we kind of dive into it, um, I think one of the most important um, points here has to do with what a fairy tale is and also has to do with like how they affect children. So right in the beginning, um, Tatum, 1997, and you don't, you don't need to know who these authors are, right? Like just the arguments are what matter. Um, suggests that identity formation of children of color in the United States travels a different path from that of children who belong to the dominant culture, i.e. white children. So right away, um, these authors are arguing that the way a child of color forms their self-concept is different than how a white child forms that self-concept. Um, and these authors are going to argue that that has to do with the images these children are seeing of goodness and evil in fairy tales. That's not all it has to do with, but that's what they're focusing on. Um, so the function of fairy tales, I think we talked about in class before we um, moved to digital class time, um, how fairy tales are educational. Like the point of a fairy tale is to teach children how to be morally good, 
um, to teach them just lessons about like how to be a person in the world. And I really like um, this sort of excerpt at the bottom of page 221 <clears throat> from this article by Zeitz, published in 1994. So again, right, like academic sources are going to be constantly like citing what they're in conversation with. It's really, it's a conversation among experts in the field. So these are the six key features of how a fairy tale was institutionalized for children. This is how we recognize like a Disney fairy tale, for example. A, the social function of the fairy tale must be didactic and teach a lesson that corroborates the code of civility as it was being developed at that time. Meaning um, how to be like a normal, how to fit in in society. It has to teach children how to do that. Um, B, it must be short so that children can remember and memorize it and so that both adults and children can repeat it orally. C, it must pass the censorship of adults so that it can be easily circulated. D, it must address social issues such as obligation, sex roles, class differences, power, and decorum so that it will appeal to adults, especially those who publish and publicize the tales. E, it must be suitable to be used with children in a schooling situation. And F, it must reinforce a notion of power within the children of the upper classes and suggest ways for them to maintain power, which I think is really interesting. Like that's not something we normally think of when we think of fairy tales. Um, but according to this author, fairy tales, and particularly Disney versions of fairy tales, need to somehow reinforce the status quo. Um, so upper class children or more privileged children should feel privileged when they watch these movies. Um, and this, again, this text that they're citing is from 1984, so things have maybe changed a little. Um, the other thing I really want to draw your attention to in this description of fairy tales is that they must address social issues such as obligation, sex roles, class differences, power, and decorum. Um, and so I think it's really easy to like write off Disney movies and just say, oh, like they don't matter. Why are we talking about this in an academic setting? But the reason we're talking about it in an academic setting is because they explicitly address social issues. Um, so, and they do so in a way that is supposed to teach children um, how to navigate those social issues. So that's, that's why I think that's important. All right, so then, um, they give us this study by Yeoman, 1999, um, who conducted an ethnographic study with children in a fourth and fifth grade classroom aged 9 to 11 in a public urban Canadian school. Um, so what I want to point out to you is both the way the study worked and also, um, this is page 222, um, that the classroom quote, it included exposure to disruptive texts, as well as exposure to traditional and the dominant and influential Disney film version of classic fairy tales. Um, so when this author talks about disruptive texts, um, this is in your discussion questions as well, um, they really mean texts that don't reinforce a notion of power within the dominant class of children. Um, so oftentimes disruptive texts just come from different cultures, so not like American fairy tales. So some of the ones they used here are Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters, um, which I think takes place in Africa, um, in a story called The Talking Eggs. So this teacher was trying to expose children to texts um, that didn't just present like white princesses who were helpless but had black heroines instead who were not helpless and not like looking for Prince Charming. Um, and apparently in these classrooms children were able to sort of understand um, like the gender dynamics in the stories but they kept drawing um, white princesses even when the heroine of a story was black or they didn't know what race the heroine of a story was. Um, so the children 
almost invariably drew white characters no matter what color they were themselves. Um, and so despite the exposure to disruptive text, I think these authors are saying that like our culture is so suffused with these images of whiteness as synonymous with goodness that children are still equating those two things. Um, so one of the kids said that she drew um, Blanche as white like Cinderella and not like Mufaro's daughter Niasha because, quote, I mostly thought that she would get married and live happily ever after. So this is just one classroom, like, so there are limits to this study, um, but I think the implications are, you know, compelling. Um, and keep in mind, the author's purpose here is to be, um, is to encourage teachers to teach young children fairy tales that are not just um, perpetuating the status quo. So to teach disruptive texts. So, um, I think I want to mostly skip the color symbolism in the written source text because we're not dealing with those in this class. We're going to be dealing with the movies. Um, so let's go to color symbolism in the Disney versions. This begins on page 224. Um, so the first sentence here tells us what they're going to be showing. The Disney film versions of these same texts reveal indisputable evidence of white privileging and a binary color symbolism that associates white with goodness and black with evil. So when someone talks about like a binary, it's just two opposite sides of something, right? So like, uh, like male, female is what people are talking about when they talk about the gender binary. Um, binary code is zeros and ones, right? Like it's two sort of opposite things. And so, um, binary color symbolism is color symbolism in which like black is bad and white is good and you'll see there's like there's not a lot of gray area um, and usually critics um, are I guess critical <laughs> sorry critics are critical of um, binary color symbolism and binaries in general because it doesn't like leave a lot of space in the middle um, and yeah so um i think some of these examples work better than others and i definitely want you you know as you're reading these texts to be critical of them right like this is um these are some of the ideas that exist in the world um about disney movies and some of the ideas that have led to movies like moana being made but um, you know, you don't have to agree with everything, right? So, um, let's see. Snow White features a wicked queen dressed in black who lives in a black castle that has black rats, a dangerous black forest containing black bats and black owls. The wicked queen also has a black crow-like bird perched on a human skull. In the end, the film implies that the Wicked Queen is devoured by black vultures. Even the poisonous apple turns black to symbolize what lies within before turning red again. On the other hand, Snow White is surrounded by white birds, the prince appears on a white horse, on a white horse, Snow White is laid to rest on white flowers, holding a bouquet uh, of white flowers before the prince returns to rescue her, and they ride off on his white horse toward his white castle. <laughs> um, Whiteness is not simply a color, but a symbolic marker of goodness. So something that you definitely want to keep in mind with this, um, with, with this argument is that these authors are looking not only at race explicitly, but also just color symbolism more generally. So they're saying that, first of all, yes, it is a problem that most Disney princesses are white, which um, promotes white supremacy, according to them, by exclusion and by exaggerating like the power of whiteness, but then an exclusion, you know, excluding um, princesses of color for the most part from the Disney movies. Um, but on the other hand, these authors are also saying that 
outside of skin color, black is still used to promote like the idea of evil and white is still used to promote the idea of goodness. Okay. Um, so if you go through this, right, like there's just evidence after, like just lots of evidence um, from every single movie that they are studying of how color symbolism is used. So for your essays, when you're going to be making an argument about a Disney movie, I really want you to be like looking at this as a really good example of how to incorporate evidence um, that supports your argument, right? So this list of all the black stuff associated with the evil queen and Snow White and then all the white stuff associated with Snow White herself is very effective evidence to show the way that binary color symbolism is used. Um, okay, so I think we could look at The Little Mermaid as well. Um, so where was Snow White, which is from 1937, it's really old. The color, like every single character in that movie was white, and the color symbolism was not associated with like actual people's races. Um, the Little Mermaid is a different example. So here's what we have, this is on page 226 in the middle. Um, the Little Mermaid features seven mermaid princesses, all white. Um, the Little Mermaid falls for a black-haired, blue-eyed, white human prince. The only major character of color in this film is Sebastian, who is clearly, by his accent and behavior, Caribbean. Okay, so Sebastian is the crab, if you remember him. So if you think about his accent, he sounds like sort of Jamaican. Um, so even though he's not depicted as like a black person, he is still... Um, presented as a character of color because he has a Caribbean accent. Um, so he is the servant of Ariel's father and um, he's depicted with what you could consider somewhat racist stereotypes. Like first of all, he's a servant. And second of all, his major song in the movie is Under the Sea, which is about um, not wanting to work. So like under the sea, we like laugh and play. If you look at the lyrics of that song, um, up on the shore they work all day. Under the sea, up, up on the shore they slave away. I sang this in choir when I was in middle school, so I know the words to it. Um, I'm trying to remember. So this song is all about how outside of the sea people work too much and under the sea they get to just chill and live like happy lives. Um, so it could possibly be argued that this is sort of a depiction of like a stereotype of laziness um, uh, on the part of people from the Caribbean. So some issues with that movie. Um, and then of course we have the depiction of Ursula um, who has blue black skin. She's not really depicted as white. Um, and a black, like the black body of a squid. And she also has an army of black eels. Um, let's see. And then the, the authors talk a bit about Aladdin as well, in which all of the characters are non-white, but in which darkness is still used to signify evil in some way. Um, So Jafar is introduced as, quote, a dark man who awaits a dark purpose. He's always dressed in black. He rides a black horse. Um, in the beginning of the movie, his parrot is shown as black. Um, the Cave of Wonders is guarded by a black panther, which I was personally terrified of as a child. Um, Jasmine, on the other hand, like opens a white gate, white birds fly out, um, and white is also used to symbolize wealth in this movie. So like when Aladdin comes up in the world and gets to be um, the prince, he is wearing all white, uh, which is something I think you can still see in our world today. Um, so. On page 227, um, the authors shift to their final argument, which is that teachers have a really important role to play um, in shaping what children take away from different fairy tales. Um, so 
If teachers don't question the culture and values being promoted in the classroom, they socialize their students to accept the uneven power relation of our society along lines of race, gender, and ability. Teachers can and should challenge white supremacist values and instead promote values of self-love. Um, and so this gets to their final, you know, thing that they want readers to do, which is teach disruptive texts in the classroom. Um, and they also talk about how important it is to reread texts because when you read them critically as an adult, it often results in insights that you did not have as a child, right? Like children are just sponges. They just absorb whatever like, you put in front of them um, to a large degree. But once we're adults and, and we're in college, like we're working toward critically thinking and questioning the world around us and like forming opinions um, based on like a variety of types of knowledge. So that's what we're doing. <coughs> um, and so I really like what they, this quote that they have here on page 228 as well. If literature is a mirror that reflects human life, then all children who, who read or are read to need to see themselves reflected as part of humanity. If they are not, or if their reflections are distorted and ridiculous, there is danger that they will absorb negative messages about themselves and people like them. Those who see only themselves or who are exposed to errors and misrepresentations are miseducated into a false sense of superiority, and the harm is doubly done. Okay. Um, so if we were in class, I would ask you guys what you think about that, um, but we're, we're not. I'm just here in my house, and you're there in your houses, probably. So um, I do want you to think about that, though, right? Like, this, I think the, the two major things that we are seeing here is, um, I guess, the difference, or the things that we're going to be talking about this unit, I guess. So the difference between exploitation and representation. Um, so representation is when you see yourself reflected in a movie. It's like characters who you find relatable. Um, so there's been a real push for more representation, and that's that's what um, uh, the Lindsay Ellis video was talking about with Moana, right? Like Moana, just because some aspects of it might be culturally appropriative doesn't mean that some little girl who is... Um, like in Hawaii sees herself represented in Moana and can like feel like she's a really valid important part of humanity um, that's a good thing right so you want to see yourself represented in art we like art that we can relate to so um, the more different kinds of fairy tales are being taught to children the more likely that all children will be able to see themselves represented um, and the other problem that they kind of talk about here is that for like white girls in particular, um, if you just constantly see white princesses over and over and over again, um, it reinforces this idea that you, as a white, as a future white woman, um, are more important or more beautiful or more worthy of marriage than other women because you have seen yourself overrepresented in these stories, if that makes sense. Um, okay. So they talk a little bit too at the end about gender and stuff, um, but I think I'm going to leave that there and ask you guys to think about Mommy Rata because that is an example of a disruptive text and a text that does not represent good with white or evil with bad, right? So some things I want you to notice about that um, after you've watched it. Notice what evil looks like, right? Does that monster look like anything familiar to you? Or is it just like, a, I don't know, like, like what colors are the monster? Um, what does the monster's face look like? Um, so, so tell me what that monster looks like in the discussion. Um, I'd also like you to be thinking about what evil looks like, right? So in that story, um, the monster is cursed. And the heroine, Mami Wata, saves the monster from a curse, as opposed to in many Disney versions where the evil character 
is just evil and we don't know their backstory and the hero has to kill them or like remove them somehow there's no redemption for the hero um so i'd like you to think about how those things kind of are are different lessons for children than the ones that are often given in disney um okay so i think that is your lecture for today um sorry this is a little late i spent all morning trying to switch modems and get the internet to work better and etc just a just a whole thing so um all right so anyway uh yeah i hope you guys are doing well staying safe social distancing very important just because you don't feel sick doesn't mean you know someone around you get sick so um yeah i'll talk to you guys soon um please answer the discussions and let me know if you have any questions